Welcome to the chemisode on organic chemistry, which is about polymers. This is the third and final chemisode on organic chemistry, and it is actually the final chemisode in the whole of Unit 1. So once we've finished this, go out and celebrate, and we've finished Unit 1. So let's go look at polymers. All right, in this episode, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the formation of polymers, how polymers form. We're going to look at the types and different types of uses for polymers. So we're going to do a really brief explanation of some of the different types of polymers. We're going to look at fractional distillation, which isn't actually to do with polymers, but it's, in, it's needed in the course that you're doing. So you need to understand what fractional distillation is. It's to do with organic molecules, but it's not actually to do with polymers. So we're going to kind of throw that in there because I forgot to do it last lesson. And then lastly, we're going to do a summary of organic molecules. We're going to look at um, all the stuff that you should know from the last, from all these three different episodes on organic molecules. So let's go have a look at the formation of polymers. Now, what polymers are, they're basically really, really, really long chains of carbon. And what they are, they're formed from things called monomers. So monomers are the small building blocks that make up polymers. So what you'll have is we can form them by doing additional polymerization. That is an additional reaction which combines monomers together to make a polymer. How we do that is we take an um, a, a alkene, so this for example is ethene that you can see in front of you here, and what we do is we want to have ethene reacting with many other ethenes in additional reactions. And as you know, addition reactions involve breaking a double bond and having something join on to either side of that. So I'm going to show you how this works. The double bond here, it breaks and it joins on between these two carbons here. So if I do a, um, an animation to show that how that works, it basically looks like this, where the double bond breaks and joins on either side in between here and here. This is making a polymer where you're um, joining two of these things called monomers together, making a polymer, a long chain. And the way we name these polymers is we have the monomer, which is here, called ethene. ethene. Obviously, it's a double bond between two carbons, ethene. That creates a polymer, polyethene. Okay. Interesting thing to note, what you need to be able to do is to show that the double bond joins onto the carbon where the other double bond is. So if you have a longer than two carbons, it doesn't just join onto either end of the chain, it joins onto where the double bond is in that chain. So let's have a look at another example where we're going from a polymer and working out what the monomer actually is. Okay, so here's another polymer. Here's the polymer. So we want to work out what monomers could have been made or used to create this polymer here. We've got a long chain of carbons, obviously, and we want to work out what um, monomers were used to make this long chain of carbons. To do that, what we simply do is do the opposite of what we did last time. Instead of creating the long chain, we want to cut it up into smaller chains. The way we go about that is to, first of all, step one is to put a double bond in every second carbon. So here's a double bond, here's a double bond, here's a double bond, here's a double bond, here's a double bond. Once we have that, once we have um, the double bonds in there, what we can then remove is the other bond. So that one gets removed and it divides it up into this separate monomers. So let's have a quick look at that again. What are my steps? Oops. My steps are, I'll just go back again. First of all, every second bond, I create a double bond. And then I remove my single bond. And there, I divide it up into the monomers that were used to create this polymer. And you can see that it's um, obviously one, two, three carbons on this in this monomer. So this is propane. And this one is something that you can't name. It's got obviously three carbons and an OH with a double bond. But you can see that this is one of the monomers that were used to create the overall polymer. Remember, put in your 
every second bond as double and then remove the single ones that you are left with. And that's how you divide a polymer up into a monomer. So if I just go back through this again and have a quick look at it, um, to create a polymer, what you simply do is um, remove the double bond and put it in between the two carbons that used to have the double bond. So you can see how that moves into a polymer that way. And then to break them up, add in your double bond and then remove your single bonds. So that's creating a polymer and also breaking a polymer up into monomers. Let's have a look at some of the properties and uses for polymers. Now two things that are interesting within um, polymer um, behavior is two properties. The first one is to do with um, branching of polymers. We have two things. We have LDPE. So this is low density polyethane. Low density polyethane has lots of branches on it. Basically, it's, it has lots of um, a big polymer, but it also has some branching here. What this branching means is that you can't put two monomers close together. It makes it very low in density. You can't pack them very close together. This other one here, HDPE, is called high density polyethane. With high density polyethane, what you get is just really straight chain of carbons with no real um, branching as such. So with no branching, these things can be stacked really close together and that means you get a high density. You get a lot of them in a small area. The difference in properties between low density and high density are very, very great. Low density polyethane is very soft. It's got a low melting point and it's very flexible as well. Things like, um, what's it called? Plastic wrapping is formed from low density polyethane. Your shopping bags that you get from the supermarket, that's low density polyethane. Because it has this structure of branches and it can't get close together. So that's low density. High density polyethane, okay, this is a very hard um, molecule. This is a very hard substance. It's got a higher boiling point and it's more for rigid um, things. So things like um, your milk cartons are high density polyethane and other hard substances like that are made from high density polyethane. It has a higher boiling point because you've got a greater dispersion forces holding these um, chains together. Both of them have dispersion forces, but the high density has a greater dispersion force because those particles or those chains are closer together than the low density polyethane. The next thing that affects polymers is called cross-linking. And that's where you have um, chains of polymers, so long chains of carbon. If you have no cross-linking whatsoever, it's a very, very um, soft, very, very flexible and very low melting point um, material. It's very easy to move these things across. If you have occasional cross-linking, so every now and then you get a cross-linking happening, what this does, it adds elastic memory to your polymer. So things like elastic bands have occasional cross-linking. So that means you have a chain and a link to another chain. So cross-linking um, changes the properties in that way. If you go up the other end of the scale where you have lots of cross-linking, what this does is it makes it a very, very, very hard substance. The molecule is really tightly bound together and it will act more like a covalent network lattice where you have lots of linking in between chains. It makes it very hard and very, very, very tough to move and gives it a very high melting point. This will more, more likely burn or decompose than it will melt. Things like your, um, your pots and pans, you know the plastic handle on the pots and pans? That's made from things with lots of cross-linking in it, okay? So if you cross-link polymers, if you have no cross-linking, it's a very soft, very low boiling point. Occasional cross-linking, as I said, makes it elastic. Elastic bands means that it has a memory. If you stretch it, it will go back to where it came from. So it will move back to where it is. And then if you have high cross-linking, you end up with a very strong polymer. Um, so that's cross-linking. That's how you look at the um, properties of different um, polymers. And so you need to think about, is it branched or is it cross-linked? And explain what happens when it's branched and what happens when it's cross-linked. The next thing, as I said, is fractional distillation. 
Now, this isn't as such to do with um, polymers, but it's to do with um, hydrocarbons in general, and it's to do with separating out and actually obtaining hydrocarbons from nature. Hydrocarbons, as um, a general term for organic molecules, um, the simplest ones being hydrogen and carbon, these guys are obtained from crude oil. So they're dug out of the ground, they're pumped out of the ground in the form of oil. Crude oil is um, obviously what um, a very, very important substance because we can make so much stuff from it. Crude oil is a mixture of all different lengths in hydrocarbon chains. The idea is when we get crude oil, it's a mixture of all these things, all these different hydrocarbons, right from C1, from methane to ethane to butane, all the way up to C40, so like 40, hydrocarb 40 carbons in a row. What we need to do is separate these uh, molecules out and the way we do that is we separate them out using this thing called fractional distillation. Fractional distillation works on the, the fact that as you get a longer chain of carbons, you get to increase the boiling point of that hydrocarbon. So we can separate them out by looking at their boiling points and we can separate them out using this thing called a fractionating tower. What we do is um, we heat up crude oil, so it's, it's very, very hot, so it's about... Um, 300, 400 degrees, and we put it into this fractionating tower. When it gets to 300 and 400 degrees, the majority of these hydrocarbons um, are a gas. So what happens is they don't actually fall down the bottom here. The ones that fall down the bottom when it's really hot are the ones that are really, really long. So the longest chain hydrocarbons are still liquid at 400 degrees because they have a very high boiling point. So when you heat crude oil up and you shove it into this fractionating tower, the really, really long hydrocarbons end up coming out the bottom here. Slowly, as the um, crude oil cools down, you get um, less and less carbons becoming a, a liquid. So as you cool it down, it gets a little bit cooler. The things, let's give these um, names, let's give these. Um, these hydrocarbons here have, um, I'll actually just wait two seconds, I'll find out how many carbons are in each of these. Okay, so now I've got what how many carbons there are here. So as you enter with um, really hot crude oil, um, your bitumens are basically above C70. So things with more than 70 carbons in them are bitumens. These come out at the bottom because they have a really high boiling point. Even at about like 500, 400 degrees, they're still not a gas. As you move up and it cools down, you end up coming out with about C20 to C50 around your greases and waxes. Coming out here as well are things like your, your fuel oils, things for um, really large container ships. They burn oils with lots and lots of carbons. So these guys come out here because it's a bit cooler. As it cools down, these guys come out. So here you've got about 600 degrees. Here you've got around about... 300 ish. So about 300 degrees is when these guys start to condense into liquids and they come out there. As you move up, you get less and less carbons in your chain. So things like diesels and oils, so these are like your, um, your diesel engines, they use carbon chains of about 14, around about um, give or take. And these guys condense out at around about 150 degrees. So as you're cooling down, things are starting to condense. As you move up here, you've got your, your kerosene and your, your naphtha. These guys are around about C5 to C10. So things like your kerosene lamps, things like your butane, um, not butane, sorry, um, things like your, your unleaded fuel and things like that. These guys come out around about here. So um, obviously these guys have a lower boiling point. It might be around about 70 degrees between 70 and 100. So as you're cooling it down, you're getting things with smaller chains coming out because of the boiling point that these guys have. Right at the top here, you've got things that are gases still at room temperature. Things like methane, um, ethane, propane and butane, they just pump up at the top here. So as you heat crude oil, everything's a gas down here apart from your, your bitumen and your, your tar and stuff like that. As you cool it down slowly, you get these fractions coming off with smaller um, carbon chains. So obviously, the higher you go, the smaller the carbon chain because this lower the boiling point. The further down, the further down your column, 
you get a higher boiling point, so therefore you get a longer chain coming out. And that's how we separate hydrocarbons. We can um, get crude oil and separate it out into the various fractions that we can use for different um, things. So most of these are used for fuels, as you know, crude oil, or if you've heard of oil in general being mentioned in the news, that's used for fuel. And it's a very, very important product because we can make so much stuff out of this crude oil. That's it. Here's a summary of what you need to know for organic chemistry, and then I'll finish this and you guys can go off and do some practice exams because we've covered pretty much all of Unit 1. What you need to be able to do is name organic compounds. This is part found in um, part 9.1, naming organic compounds. You should be able to draw the full structure and the semi-structure for organic compounds. I haven't really gone over semi-structure, but um, it's pretty self-explanatory really. It just means you don't draw the single bonds in between your carbons. So draw the full and semi-structure of organic compounds. You should be able to write combustion, addition, and cracking reactions. This part here, the reactions, was part of 9.2, um, the video 9.2. The last video, this one that you're watching now, we learned how to draw polymers. We explained the properties of organic compounds. So we explained um, the properties of different polymers. And we also explained some of the properties of normal organic compounds in terms of their boiling points. Remember, the longer the chain, the greater the dispersion force and therefore the greater the boiling point. And we also explain fractional distillation and how it is used to separate hydrocarbons. And that's it. That is your summary for organic com compounds. And what I might do is I might just quickly do a overall summary of all the stuff you need to know for Unit 1. Uh, I've got a, a worksheet which explains all the details, um, all the things that you should be able to do. I'll put that up on Edmodo for you to look at and I'll also um, think about making a video for that as well. I can't guarantee you I will, but I might. And that's it. That is the end of Unit 1 for Chemistry. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in Unit 2.